All right, so for those of you just tuning in, we're about to spectate a 1v1 on the map sent outs between my viewers as part of my weekly Twitch TV live streams. If you want to get in on this, I highly encourage you to head on over to my Twitch page and scroll underneath the video player there to find my schedule. If you follow me on Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter, you will get updates on when we're streaming next. In today's video, it's going to be a 1v1 2K rated sent outs game between Krizini and Kaladin, aka Telemachos. Without further ado, Oop, we gotta switch the reveal map back to normal, and yes, GLHF. It's gonna be a great game. These two players are some of the higher rated players on the HD ladder, so I expect to see some excellent gameplay between them. And it looks like it's gonna be a Mongols versus Japanese civilization matchup. So I'm gonna talk quite a bit about the matchup dynamics between these two civilizations during this video, the goal of which to hopefully improve your overall gameplay. If you're interested in seeing more civilization matchup analysis videos, then I've got plenty of them on my YouTube channel, as well as tutorials and expert gameplay. All that stuff either in the description or you can just search for it on the page. I also do videos for games beyond just Age of Empires 2, and if you want to support the longevity of the channel, then that's one of the best ways to do it is by checking those out. So, Rosini versus Kaladin. We have Krizini playing as the Blue Mongols on the bottom side of the map, and we have Kaladin playing as the Green Japanese. The map today is Senots, as I've said before. Senots is very similar to Arabia. It's actually a remarkably similar map. I forget who, but one of my viewers was requesting recently that I do play this map. If it was you, then feel free to uh, point it out. And What's interesting about Senos is that it's Arabia, but the tree lines are a little bit smaller, so this is actually a very aggressive map. And I wanted to do this in a stark contrast to the 3v3 Black Forest game I just casted, because, yeah, we got to see our booms coming on today, and now it's going to be a very aggressive game. These ponds don't really contain much fish. They're not actually worth docking unless you have at least four shore fish, which is pretty unlikely. I think this is the only one. Yeah, this is the only one with four shore fish. And it's just an aggressive map overall. It's very similar to Arabia. And this means that the players in this game are very likely to go for things like a Dark Age Rush with Militia, or maybe they'll go for a Feudal Age Rush with things like Scouts, Archers, maybe even Men at Arms plus Watchtowers. We'll have to see. Corbix isn't calling out. Mongols are going to die in a tornado. <laughs> Actually, a Typhoon twice and call GG. Yeah, this is, a, this is a historically very interesting matchup indeed. I remember reading about the uh, Mongols' attempted invasions of Japan. So we'll have to see which of these two civs comes out on top. But... Uh, Rituia says that the Typhoon is useless against good micro. That's where we're playing on Senos, of course, not Arabia. That way there's enough water to actually summon the Typhoon in the first place. So, let's talk a little bit about the individual civilizations. And I'm going to start by talking about Spirit of the Law's favorite civilization. This is going to be the Japanese, played by Kaladin today. The Japanese are actually one of my favorite civilizations. They're not my favorite personally, though, but they're one of them. This is a very well-rounded civilization, especially in the... Uh, DLCs on Steam, where now the Japanese have bloodlines. That really shored up the one kind of hold in their tech tree, which is that their cavalry was not that great. Uh, but they have very good archers, they have full archer range, and then they also have a barracks, uh, which is also full too, and they have excellent technologies for their barracks units. In fact, 25% faster attack speed for the infantry is almost like dealing 25% more damage overall, which is absolutely huge. And against things like heavy cavalry units, like paladins and whatnot, Having your halberdiers attack faster means that they're more likely to get off an attack before they die, and then they also get to leverage their attack bonus more often. That is huge. The Japanese have some of the best late-game trash units because of that. Their halberdiers cannot be underestimated. In addition to that, their champions definitely can see some fringe use, uh, particularly as a counter to things like elite eagle warriors, huskarls, for example, any sort of high pierce armor infantry in it, um, or just trash units in general, things that don't cost gold, so... Uh, the champion is actually pretty good. The samurai, their unique unit has an attack bonus versus other unique units, which is actually pretty nice against the Mongols, uh, because the Mongols are generally a civilization that revolves around their Mangadai unit. But I'll talk a little bit about that after I'm done talking about the Japanese. I don't think that'll come too much into play, though, because even though the samurai does eat the Mangadai for breakfast, in practice the Mangadai can just out-micro you, so it's really difficult to actually leverage that. In addition, the Japanese have a very strong, like, slow-style push, too, because their trebuchets... Uh, actually deploy and redeploy faster, which really helps out quite a bit. Generally, when it comes to the Japanese, their early game economy is decent, but it's going to be weaker than the Mongols. The uh, reduced wood cost on their resource drop-off buildings helps shore up their early game. So, 
Overall, I feel like the Japanese have a lot of strong options at their disposal, and they have the tools needed to take on the Mongols. But the Mongols as a civilization are known for their frightening speed, both militarily and economically. How historically fitting. The Mongol civilization, their defining characteristic is that they hunt 50% Faster. This is a colossal early game bonus and really catapults them to being one of the uh, strongest competitive civilizations in Age of Empires 2. This allows you to get through the ages a lot quicker, as hunting is such a dominant, efficient source of food in the early game. You have to lure your boar, and if you're the Mongols, you really want to grab that deer. These deer, though, really far forward, so I don't know if Krasini will want to take them. But yes, the Mongols' early game with the 50% faster uh, food income uh, from... Hunting it means that they have an excellent scout rush, and they're just going to be a much faster civ than the Japanese. The Japanese are not the slowest civ, but Mongols will get there first, they will apply some pressure, and Krasini trying to do a forced drop-off here, yes, for his fast feudal age, and it's going to be a lot faster than Telemachos, aka Kaladin. Uh, the score discrepancy, I believe, is due to uh, just scouting primarily right now. It's not that Krasini is you know, that OP, but he's a very strong player, so... Yeah, this is going to be a 21 population fast feudal age from Krasini. What will he go for? Probably the scouts. So how does this fare against the Japanese, right? Well, the thing is, is that the Japanese have excellent spearmen that attack 25% faster starting in the feudal age, which makes the scout rush a lot weaker from the Mongols, and the Japanese aren't extremely slow. But it looks like, though, that Krasini is actually going to go for what appears to be a men-at-arms rush, plus, like, watchtowers, and this could be actually a really good way to neuter the, the Japanese, because... Oh, and he's actually going to go for boar steel, too. How long was that boar there? I feel like... I feel like this boar lure might have been a little late uh, from Telemachos, but yeah, wow, Krasini. Oh, no, no, he's not even going for a, a tower rush. What? <laughs> These four villagers are actually just going to be on uh, on deer there, so I see how it is. Uh, but stealing this boar through the Mongols is even better because you hunt it 50% uh, faster, so... Kaladin desperately trying to block this, so it looks like he's not going for a super aggressive forward. This actually might just be the scout rush I was talking about. I, I feel like it's probably the scout rush. He doesn't really have the wood to build the stable yet, but it looks like that's actually the, that's actually what he's going for. Okay, here comes the boar. Nice. He is actually going to be able to steal it. That's really bad uh, for uh, for Telemachos, aka Kaladin, over here because the Mongols are faster, and now they're going to be even faster. And yes, okay, so it is going to be the scout opening. The Japanese should probably be able to deal with this, but this is going to come out with a boosted extra boar. So this is going to be really tricky for. Uh, Kaladin. Kaladin is on his way to the Feudal Age, uh, but the thing is, is, is that if you... He's trying to delay this, this stable. If the scouts get there before you're completely in the uh, the Feudal Age, that's really bad, because you need to get out like a like two spearmen ASAP and pronto. And you also need to make sure that you do some nice makeshift walling to uh, restrict the mobility of those scouts so that they don't get into your economy. So great to see uh, Kaladin doing that right about now. Uh, of course, Grazini got to the Feudal Age first, and he's leveraging that plus two in, uh, attack that he gets on his Scout Cavalry uh, the moment that he gets there, and this is great. And he will be able to pull back. Nice. All right, here come the Scouts from Grazini. Will uh, Kaladin be able to hold on? In terms of the Civilization matchup as the game drags on, uh, I feel like the in the early game, the Mongols are a bit better. In the mid-game, it, it could probably go either way. But in the Imperial Age, the Mongols have a lot of interesting tools at their disposal, but they have a very slow, and I mean very, very slow, early Imperial Age. Because in general, the Mongols like to leverage their strongest units and their bonuses, which are going to be things such as the uh, an Elite Mangadai plus Hussar plus Siege Weapon Army Comp is very, very standard for the Mongols. And my question is, is do the Japanese necessarily have the tools to deal with this? Nice, because he's going to get a, a little bit of a pick-off there. It's just that, that that Army Comp is incredibly slow. You have to research Elite Magna, you have to build all those castles and get all the upgrades for your siege weapons. That could take eons. And that gives the Japanese, as a civilization, a lot of breathing room there. The Mongols are lacking things like gunpowder, which the Japanese critically have access to hand cannons. Something that you might need to make quite frequently, but it's not going to really come to play. I feel like one of the better ways to deal with like the siege push like that is with things like bombard cannons, which the, the Japanese don't actually have. But with the Japanese having an excellent archery range, I feel like if you make, like, skirms and onagers and whatnot, with the bloodlines, they've got hussars. I think that's something that they can use to deal with the Mongols if they can survive early game. But I feel like the Mongols' early game, especially with the missing boar, can be a bit overbearing. So it's going to be up to Kaladin to stall, and then I feel like the matchup will probably even out a little bit. I'd expect to see maybe in the later stages of the game, 
a more of an archery range focused playstyle from the Japanese to just try and deal with the Mongols. Because uh, if you end up going for something that's like too heavily infantry based, then I feel like you just get kited really hard by the Mangadai, and that could just be a disaster. So maybe things like Halberd Years plus, plus Skirms uh, plus Siege Weapons. The Trash and Siege style push is actually quite nice versus the Mongols because. Their army comp is really, really expensive, and even though your army sucks if you go for that, and generally I wouldn't recommend it, it's just in a matchup like that, you're really bleeding them dry in the gold department. So I feel like the Japanese being extremely well-rounded uh, does kind of play to their advantage as the game drags on if he can just survive. So can he do it? For Zini, we'll see how, uh, how hard he commits to this scout rush. Meanwhile, back at home, not really adding any additional military buildings. He hasn't walled up at all, really, either. Ah, he's going to put down a blacksmith over there. Nice. And now he's going for the engagement. Will Kaladin be able to hold the line? Uh, the answer is yes. I believe they just traded a scout uh, for a scout. And yeah, two spearmen here. You don't want to overcommit to this. And what's nice is the way he set this up is he's created like a choke point. This is the only place that Krasini can engage here. And notice how he spaced out the two spearmen. That way they're more, more likely to actually get one attack off. But 25% extra uh, infantry attack speed bonus is so, so sick. And Krasini... Looking for a window of opportunity, but the scout rush gonna get denied. I feel like Krasini is ahead anyway. Calvin at 36 population, and then uh, Krasini at 33. Oh no, so I guess it's mostly just a scouting thing. Nice. So, and now Kaladin on the counterattack with his own scouts. Where will he go? Attacking this mill is not a good thing, uh, but obviously his attention is divided right now. What he needs to do is he needs to find some exterior villagers, try and pick those off. Look for those lumberjacks, those foragers. I suppose he could kill the mill too. Great to see that Krasini actually did mill those deer, though. I feel like it's important to grab your deer as the Mongols because of that uh, hunting bonus. And now Krasini didn't commit to this too hard. He went straight to the Castle Age. This is going to be huge. Um, one of the nice things about the Scouts is that even though it's so easily counterable by going for things like Palisade Walls and Spearmen, going for this strategy... He's just going to kill the mill. I feel like this is a big waste. Going for this strategy, most important thing is it gives you map control. That's what Scouts are all about. With that added map control, you can actually fast castellate safely off the back of this. Kaladin not really able to move out and apply any offensive pressure, giving Krasini that window of opportunity. Krasini doesn't need to necessarily kill your villagers with his scout as long as he keeps you in your own base. Krasini saves so much wood by not walling on his own because he knows he's not going to be attacked. And going straight for the castellate with no defensive infrastructure at all is risky as hell, especially on a map like this. So will it pay off? Will it pay off? We'll have to see. But I think the answer is yes. I think this was a bold move by Krasini. But Kaladin, bottled in his own base, nowhere near the castle age of his own. And now he wants to transition to very standard archers. And I feel like what's really snowballing the game is stealing that boar. It really is. The Japanese want to get to that mid to late game where they're broad, open tech tree that's very difficult to exploit really just comes into play, and he's not going to be able to do that. With the missing boar, Krasini had enough extra food that he was able to get to the castle age despite going for a scout rush. And Kaladin slows him down too. So, he's putting out a lot of farms. I think Kaladin recognizes that the important thing here is grabbing wheelbarrow. This is a good time to get it. He recognizes that the most important thing here is he doesn't fall behind too much from a technology perspective. Gotta be careful not to lose that scout. I also feel like he could have done something with those scouts too. Picked off some villagers because really Krasini doesn't have much of a wall off at all. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Krasini clicked up a while ago. And now Krasini is, yeah, he's in the castle age now, so. Krasini in an excellent uh, position. He's going to go for a fairly standard two-stable knight's opening with a one town center on the backside. Will he be grabbing the Bosa upgrade immediately? This is why Krasini is such a good player. Not only, he must have watched my Night Rush tutorial. <laughs> in my Night Rush tutorial, uh, I talked a little bit about this specific build. The, you know, the two stable plus one town center plus bow saw thing. You want to get bow saw almost always immediately when you hit the castle age. It's just a huge boost to your economy. And double bit axe as well should be researched really early unless you're going for a fast castle age. So you really want those uh, wood chopping upgrades early. It allows you to, it frees up so much space in your economy to assign those villagers elsewhere. It's such an efficient upgrade. It's one of the most efficient upgrades in the game. Grab that bow saw early. He's putting down that town center. And he also knows... When you put down your, your town center, you're going for Night Rush. You want to put it uh, next to your main gold as well as your wood line. Because he's going to need this gold to sustain night production. And he's also going to need this wood to build farms. So, Krasini, with kind of an immaculately executed two stable night build. Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And now, Kaladin in an awkward situation. Where are those villagers going? They should have gone through the Palisade Gate, but they didn't make it in. 
And this is when, once again, our friend Not Excellent Map Generation strikes. It'd be really difficult for him to actually mine any gold, and this means he could be stuck in the Feudal Age for years. But no, Kaladin, also a very good player. I wonder why these villagers were walking all the way around here. Might have been a misclick. He's going to repair this Palisade Gate, which is good. So, this is why Kaladin has such a high rating. Yeah, because he as well notices that the most important thing that he can do in this matchup right now is to just make sure that he is on an even footing with Krasini at all time from a tech perspective. So, he put down an excessive amount of farms. So, this is where I feel like I personally make a lot of mistakes when I play, is, is at this transition phase. I know that I need to get to the Castle Age, but I feel like at this point, you need to just take a bunch of villagers off of food and reassign them elsewhere. I don't know what his uh, his planned army comp is, but 500 food, methinks, is not what you need to make it. You want this many farmers to get to the Castle Age. I think that that's also a common mistake that players make. Good to, uh, good that he's actually recognizing that there could be holes in his wall that will pop up soon. And he just does not have access to gold. This is really awkward for him. I mean, what, what, what are units is going to make? What is he going to do? I think he needs to retask some of these villagers off of food. He's 600 food in the bank and no market, so... Kaladin in the Castle Age, he's doing everything correctly, but his uh, his economy is just a little bit off, and I think that's going to cost him. Krasini, only ahead by five population. So Kaladin, doing an excellent job keeping up, but for what? So much food in the bank, he can't mine any gold, he's in such a disastrous position. I think Krasini might be able to close this one out. We'll have to see. Now, obviously, one of the nice things about these 1v1s is that they're just faster, which means that, you know... Those of us with a busy work schedule get to sit down and watch them. This will, this might not be the closest game you ever see, but I think there's so much to learn from it. We don't need our, our two-hour-long slugfest. Here comes the Spearman. 25% faster attack speed coming into play, but not the best micro. Notice how those Spearmen weren't attacking at all while they took so much damage from those knights. I don't think that was an attack move. I'm not exactly sure, but that's just really, really bad. I also think you should be chopping that wood line, not this one. It's really easy for me to point these things out because... Obviously, the pressure is on Kaladin right now. He's an extremely good player, and he's been making good plays. Oh, shit, he didn't... <laughs> he didn't include that gold mine in there. Ouchie, ouch, ouch. It's much easier for us as an outside observer to recognize these things. Because right now, he has a limited... He has a finite amount of attention. Because he's just trying to manage all these different situations at once. And, uh... Yeah, it's going to be difficult to saturate that gold mine. Rosina going to have to back up. Kaladin dying, but not dead. Huh. He didn't have enough wood to build a market to sell that food, but really this is just a this is just a big uh, eco mismanagement there. Uh, but I do that all the time. Every single time I transition to the Castle Age uh, after going for flush, I just have too many farmers. So with 700 food in the bank, he's in a super awkward uh, position. This is even worse because uh, we would generally expect him to go for for crossbows since he didn't have enough food to immediately go to the Castle Age. It's just a really nice power spike. And I think that's what he wanted to do, but now he can't do it anymore. I don't know. I don't know what he wants to do anymore. He doesn't have much of an eco. He's going to put down his town center to protect both these gold mines. So that's kind of snazzy. So if he can just not die, he might be fine. But I feel like not dying is becoming a harder and harder thing. There are three archers sitting out here. Mm, not going to pick that monk off. This is why I put things on defensive. Oh my god. Wow. Unbelievable. This, this monk, he even stopped after that. He's like, what? He just got played like a violin by Telemachos. These archers appear to be like they're not really doing anything, but he just intercepted that monk and just denied that relic. Look at all this damage. Four villagers defending the stable, repairing it, but it's actually just going to fall apart. Pikemen coming out for the Japanese. This is another thing I like about them, is that the defensive uh, pikemen from Japs are actually pretty good. So, this villager not even touching the stable and, he, and she is repairing it. That just goes to show the value of uh, years of experience in school. That's incredible technique. I haven't seen anything like that in my all my years of casting. So, I... Uh, Kalan's are so far behind. He's a 53 population compared to 76. The gap is only growing. Good to see him, though, actually putting down a second town center. I think that was, like, extremely necessary. Because if he keeps falling behind economically, there's no way he can keep it militarily. And he has rebalanced his economy, which is great. And he sees some idle farms. He denied that relic. It's so funny. But when you have this much map control for this long, Rosini's in an excellent position. You know, he gets to grab all the relics. He has to expand. He doesn't even have to really invest that much in his own wall off. His economy's getting huge, and he's pulling a bunch of villagers forward. I mean, he thinks this is for the killing blow, some sort of castle drop. Again, this is not going to be the closest game you ever see. But I hope that you guys are willing to leave a thumbs up anyway, because the point is, is the commentary. And from an educational standpoint. Right now, what we're doing is we're witnessing how you, as a Mongols player, 
can be Cruzini. Snowball that game out of control and apply the killing blow. How do you close it out? And there's so much, so much to learn from here. Cruzini, I think, wants to drop a castle, but he needs to mine some more stone. And this is, again, another benefit you get from uh, having map control. One well, we'll stream El Tomlinson. Uh, I don't know if I said hi to Maita, but welcome. As well, uh, Urban Cohort. Good to see you guys. So, Kaladin. Nice defensive perimeter. Uh, I think that most players would have, in a situation like this, where they fell this far behind, would have died a long time ago. But Kaladin did not. He's got the Japanese pikemen. 25% faster attack speed. Yes, he's even going to put down a defensive monastery to make monks as a counter to this push. He might be okay until this castle drop comes in for Grazini, because that's probably going to seal the deal. Castles are very difficult to remove in the castle age until trebuchets come into play. You need a lot of battery grabs. I feel like Kaladin doesn't have the economy to possibly sustain that. So look at Krasini. Let's swap his perspective. Oh, God, 310 stone. That's the timer. That's what's going to maybe close up the game. These pikemen are going to be good, but he just... Oh, God. Kaladin just holding the line. Another town center. This is a well-placed one, too. Protect both gold mines. Really, really nice. I think it's just that castle drop that he's not uh, expecting, and it's great that Krasini recognizes this. But Kaladin is going to be way too hard to breach without the castle drop. Where's the castle going to go? That's the question from Krasini. I feel like there are many good places to put this. I even feel like here's fine. As you deny the main gold, you get the main stone mine too. I would love to see this. Yeah, I mean, boy, this is 2k plus rated. Yeah, chat is pretty slow today. <laughs> but it's all fine. Let's see. So, a lot of pikemen there for Kaladin. Again, I think he's doing the right things. It's just that that, uh, that castle drop's really going to screw... Unless now, here's how we'll know how good of a player Kaladin really is, and this is a this is something that I don't think that I would necessarily be able to read the situation in, in my own games. This is a really really tricky one. Is he going to go to the Imperial Age? If yes, he can win this game. This is a mistake that even pro players make all the time: is not really being able to evaluate when you're going imp. And holy shit, I think he's gonna do it. He's even stuck. Yes, yes, that's my. That's Telemachos. He's going to add another layer of stone walls at the back here. Grazini did put that castle exactly where I thought he would to prevent additional layers of walls being added right here. Also, to... Uh, oh, yeah, this is secondary stone. Um, and then also deny this main gold mine. This is great. So, and now Calvin's going to put another layer of walls at the back, and he's going imp. Look at the way his economy is set up. He's not investing in military units at all. And this is how he's going to survive. Except he doesn't have the military... He doesn't have the buildings, does he? No! Kaladin had the exact perfect game plan to survive, but human error strikes again. Why can't humans be perfect? Damn you. <laughs> no, God. So Telemachos, with an excellent read, knows that the only way that he can possibly win this game is to get to the Imperial Age, hopefully before Krasini or around the same time Krasini does. And goddamn, he could have done it. He could have done it at the exact same time, despite being so far behind. He never panicked. He never flinched. And yet... No university down for him. This is going to give like an extra two minutes for Krasini. And in Age of Empires 2, two minutes is everything. He had the exact perfect plan. No. <laughs> Damn. But Telemachus could still win. These knights can't get in the base. There are a ton of pikemen. He's on his way to the Imperial Age. Will those two to three minutes cost him the game? We'll have to see. Now he just needs to find a way where he can uh, mine some stone. And good he is. See... This is great. A lot of excellent plays here. Telemachus on the stone. Because if he gets that defensive castle, he makes some trebs, he's in the game, he can win this. He can absolutely win this. This watchtower is also an interesting thought. Why is he building this watchtower? Does he think it can kill that castle? No. He wants to build this watchtower. That way he's ranged units to pressure those villagers trying to build that castle. If he can build this watchtower first, he might be able to deny it. This is a tough read. I don't know if he'll I don't know if he's fast enough here. He might actually be. Here come the pikemen. Wow, look at that 25% faster attacks be coming into play. They will lose this battle, though. I feel like part of it is, is due to the hill advantage a little bit, and just look at these pikemen like running around circles. Yeah, he will lose this battle, but I don't think that was the point. I think that the fact that he tasked two of his pikemen over here is brilliant. He will deny this castle, and he's buying himself time. Just goes to show, no matter how much human error comes into play, generally knowing what you're doing is good enough. Excellent. Excellent execution from Kaladin. He's in the game. <laughs> who thought he who thought he lost years ago so that's the difference between the two of them actually getting the imperial age at the same time and the difference of well just him being dead if this castle came up i really feel like that would have been gg immediately and kaladin didn't even hesitate 
he saw this castle coming up and he just started building that watchtower and that's what you have to do to deny future forward watchtowers or castles from coming down he's not going to kill the castle he wants to just poke the villagers because every time they get hit they stop building and this will allow him to survive however though you want to get to the imperial age first whenever you're going for these tread wars and well i don't know if kaladin has the stone no he does not have a stone for a castle yet because he had to build that watchtower and uh here comes another castle drop but once again kaladin 4d chess master what the what denied Krasina gets denied again this is a really entertaining game of Age of Empires 2. I love this. God damn, another castle denied for Krasini. What you gonna do when Kaladin comes for you? He's going for the Mangadai, but this this might be the Japanese window of opportunity I was talking about earlier on the game. The Mongols are one of the fastest civs in the game until they the Imperial Age and they really slow down. <laughs> Jen says the Mantel Machis is God himself. Ah uh, yes, but Krasini of course also playing very smoothly. Kaladin in the Imperial Age, Krasini just laughs because he knows this game could go on for a while now. This is this window of opportunity I was talking about. Look how slow it takes for Krasini to get Bracer, Elite Mangadai, build all those castles. He's going to die of old age before he finishes all those upgrades. But he knows he kind of has to because they're so strong for the Mongols. And, you know, generally when you're fighting somebody in Age of Empires 2, you usually want to put yourself in a position where you're forcing them to make units that are suboptimal for their civilization. Was this another castle drop that got denied? Are you kidding me? Wow, three castle drops denied, and this one as well successfully delayed. This is ridiculous. This is also going to slow down Christine even further because he needs as many castles as he can to start massing Mangadai. Is he even going to get Elite Mangadai? No, he's not even going to get Elite Mangadai. And here comes the Japanese trebuchets, which are behind the walls. Look at this game. Look at this game. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, but of course, Krasini's getting real tired of this shit. I think he just has, like, half of his economy across the map. I mean, he just has so many forward villagers here. <laughs> what on earth am I looking at? Kaladin, still in the game. I can't even begin to stress to you how far behind he was and how far ahead the Mongols were. Will the Mongols steal one of your boars? And they're already the faster civilization? And they get to the Castle Age way before you? You're so screwed. And yet you're not. This is exactly how you handle a situation like this. Krasini showing us how you can propel yourself forward, and Kaladin showing us how you can hold on. This castle will actually go up. <laughs> Krasini getting real tired of this. I feel like Kaladin doesn't have the military units or anything to really actually do anything here. Uh, yeah, he really doesn't. Okay, so he's, he's probably dead at this point, but we have to admit, that was one excellently, immaculately well-crafted defense in Spark. He has, like, what, one barracks? This is not going to cut it. But Krasini actually only had 115 population at 39 minutes in, so... Come on, he's like, he's not even that far behind. But here's the thing. He forgot the fifth resource of the game, houses. And by that, I mean I actually got Siege Ram down. We saw this in, like, Escape Gaming Masters 2. Or was that the Return of the Kings? Where all the houses died. But yeah, uh, so I think Kaladin had really well-crafted defense. And he held on for probably 20 minutes longer than everyone else thought he would be. Or maybe 15 minutes or so. It's an excellent game on both sides. He does finally apply the killing blow. He just need to get those damn castles up. My heart goes out to him. That's so annoying. <laughs> Ugh. I love it when you're trying to forward a castle on somebody and your villagers die at 99%. That happens all the time. There are a few more satisfying things than doing that to your opponent, but it's really frustrating when it happens to you. So props to Grazini for actually finishing both of these castles, really closing out the game, because I feel like he, he would fear the Japanese as the game drags on, because the Japanese is just such a broad tech tree, and they've got tools, I think, to deal with this from a cost-efficiency standpoint. Like, the Mongols only have pikemen. Their, uh, their elite skirmishers are missing uh, the archer armor upgrade, so... I feel like as the game drags on, the Japanese can, can attrition the Mongols, at least. So, yeah, the Krasini just really trying to apply the killing blow here. And he managed to do it successfully, so GG well played. Uh, please let me know in the comments below if you felt like my analysis was helpful in some way or entertaining. As always, I appreciate it, and please do take a moment to leave a like, too. Helps out a lot. As well as check out the stuff I do for games beyond just Age of Empires 2. It helps motivate me to produce more AV2 content. As well as grow the channel. So, into the achievements here. Really, this was just an excellent game. This was this is much closer than anyone thought it would be. Rosini with an insurmountable lead. Denied at every turn with his castle drops. Finally manages to close out the game. Well played, guys. GG Krasini, GG Telemachos. Krasini says nerf towers, please. <laughs> excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I hope that this showcases uh, 
some of the dynamics of how this matchup can go. I mean, uh, oftentimes we do these civilization matchup analysis things, like we're focusing on, you know, generally more open maps like uh, Arabia, or Senos in this case, which is essentially Arabia. And that's the majority of games are played on uh, open maps, but I'd be happy to revisit, uh, revisit these, for example, on things like Black Forest and whatnot. But, you know, more often than not, the these are going to be like, at least so far, they've been Arabia oriented, so we don't really get to see things like Elite Samurai come into play. But I kind of like them on uh, on Arabia because there are just so many Arabia games out there, and I feel like it really it, it helps people to see them played more aggressively, even though they don't get to see all the units come into play. And I think this was a good example of how this this matchup typically plays out. Well, the Mongols can be very far ahead early on, but the Japanese, if they are able to defend, then they can maybe attrition this later. So, yeah, because had a lot of map control. <laughs> 99% map explored, Krasini. That's, a, that's of course why his score was so high early on. The fly loser says great commentary. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, Telemontres, you did a great job defending that. That was like that was a that was a straight up tower defense mini game. And look at this. Notice how Kaladin managed to keep up in uh, in villager camp. That was so so very important. Also, as this game drags on, we got to really Krasini grab all five of those relics in a one v one. That's even more important. No trade. So you need that uh, consistent gold. We didn't really generate that much gold with this, but as the game dragged on, that was the elephant in the room that Kaladin would have to deal with. Such a well-crafted defense. Almost held the line. Almost. But again, castles were too, too strong. Yeah, he did well under the circumstances, definitely. <laughs> yeah, 1% might have been the mid middle of the ponds. All right, well... Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed watching that video. I have plenty more uh, expert games on my YouTube channel as well as tutorials, videos for other games and whatnot. As always, I appreciate the support. Also, other Civ matchup stuff. Uh, keep your eyes peeled on my uh, Twitch schedule to figure out when the next Twitch stream is. And if you follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and whatnot, you will know when I'm streaming next. I'd really appreciate if those of you would take the time to also just follow me on uh, Facebook and Twitter too. I do occasionally post updates. And yeah, it's just always wonderful to have you guys. I had a wonderful stream today. And uh, I think that's going to be mostly it. So yes, GG well played. It's spring. Rez is dying. The allergies. Oh.